All right. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Heather McCormick, and I'm the Somerville Media Center Youth uh, Media Program Coordinator. And we are here for another Somerville Public School update. Uh, and today we're going to be joined by the Somerville Public Schools Director of Finance, Fran Gorski, and uh, Ward 4 School Committee Representative, Andre Green. Thank you both so much for being here today. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Yeah. So it's been a pretty exciting week um, for news around uh, schools and uh, the budget. And so I would love to jump right in to talk about um, that the, school, the Somerville Public Schools recently finalized a budget that um, compared to other nearby cities, it's really a stark contrast. Uh, many cities are announcing massive layoffs for teachers, um, but this budget increases funding for schools actually. and uh, establishes some new positions and doesn't, I believe, have any cuts to teacher or administrator positions. Um, can you share your thoughts about uh, how you arrived at this budget and what, uh, what's being enhanced, what cuts are being made, and what do we need to know about what this budget means for Somerville youth? Sure. Do you, do you want me to start, Andre, or do you want to? You can feel free. Okay, I'll, I'll start at least from the budget perspective. Um, and thank you, Heather, for having me on today. Um, I've been the finance director for two years for the district. Obviously, we, we started this year, we ran our regular budget process, which started in January, with budget collaborative meetings with all our department heads and principals. And everything was going very smoothly up until March 11th, when after that point, the district closed. We had to come back and have remote um, meetings to reassess where we were with, with the budget process because the revenue forecasts are obviously changing with the, the closures around the country to, to head off the COVID crisis. Obviously state revenue forecasts have changed. Um, we were looking at a potential level service or a cut budget in conversation with the city and uh, I, you know, I think it's a credit to the city that we were able to you know, fund our collective bargaining agreement with the paras and also come to a, to a budget where, as you mentioned in your opening, where we have a percentage. It's a 2.19 percentage overall. Um, it's not as, as much as we would have expected over recent years, but as, as you pointed out in comparison to other districts, we're very fortunate. And there are a number, and Andre, you may want to highlight some of these programs, but some of the items that we're able to fund are the Becoming a Man initiative at the Healy and the high school. Andre may want to weigh in on that program. Um, the build initiative at the high school. Um, we are, there are a number of new positions, including a social worker position district-wide, which we feel obviously coming through, we're expecting an uptick in mental health issues coming out of this crisis. Um, we, through a number of enrollment and programmatic changes, were able to reduce our over overall number of FTEs, that's full-time equivalents for the uninitiated uninitiated out there, essentially what a full-time position would be. Um, but you're quite right, we didn't have the type of layoffs that other communities um, you know, experience. And I, I think um, that's a tribute to the school committee, to the city's commitment in funding education, and also to our, our excellent um, superintendent, Mary Skipper. Yeah, actually, I want to start from there. Um, you know, I think, you know, Mary Skipper's been on a job now this either fifth or sixth budget. It's my fifth. So my, it's her fifth as well. Um, and I think, you know, no superintendent's perfect, certainly. Um, but I think she's fantastic. And one of the places that really shows up is that she has shown time and time again a real ability to get the most out of every dollar. Um, so I think, you know, you know, while, you know, Fran is correct, correct we're used to 5% increases here in Somerville, even those 5% increases always feel like way more than that because of the creativity and flexibility which the district which is work. And even with this 2% increase, we're seeing real meaningful change happen next year. Um, obviously, I think the headline is that we are able to, to find a way to finance, not only not laying off parents, this has happened, According to the, to the National Teachers Association, 61 districts in the, in, the, in the Commonwealth out of just over 200 have announced layoffs for next year. Not only are, have we not laid up pe people, we are able to 
give paras at a fairly large pay raise to 25, so that, that a paraprofessional in Somerville with a high school diploma starts at $25,000 a year, which isn't a lot of money to be sure, but it's $5,000 more than they were, were starting with. Um, and I think it's a, it's a real statement to our commitment to, to equity, both in terms of our students and our staff. Yeah. Um, but only we were able to do that, we were actually able to bring in real programmatic changes, um, a lot of which both speak to our commitment to equity and also our you know, ability to listen. Um, the Somerville High School historically had three security monitors, you know this, yep. Heather. Mm -hmm. Students hated them. Yep. Let's, they just, sure let's, did. Just, let's just let's just let's just own it's it. Students hated them. They made that clear. There was an unfortunate incident this year. That yep. position is go that position is being is is going away. We are placing them with three deans of students, all of whom have a background in either clinical work or in in, in classroom instruction. And it's really about creating that relationship relational dynamic with students, where we're working with them, not at them. I, I, I actually, so that's fantastic to hear. That is great news and you're right because I do work with teenagers and that has been an ongoing issue and there has been a lot of antagonism, um, especially towards our, our teens of color. I'm wondering, um, because you're talking about Dean of Students, is there going to be um, funding or just a focus um, in general or maybe there already is around restorative practices and how restorative practices can be implemented in some rural high school? Absolutely, so the the three dean of students either already have sort of justice training or we'll be providing it for them. Um, you know, this has been something that we've been talking about for years. I, I first acknowledge progress may be slower than I would like, but I think we're taking this opportunity to really recommit to it. Um, additionally, we've, we're revamping and rebooting our, me, our mediation, our team mediation program. Great. Um, so I think that is very much the intent. Um, we are working, you know, last year we brought in Jessica Boston Davis as the District Director of Equity and Excellence. This year we are expanding upon that by having at each of our schools equity coordinators who are going to work with Jessica and with the staff to help, you know, figure out really good, meaningful equity PD. Sort of like, so I think it is, this is the year we're starting to put real meat on our bones of mm -hmm. the things we've been talking about. And I'm really excited about that. And again, if we're able to do that, do that on relatively short money is fantastic. To, um, one of the things that Director Gorsi brought up that I do want to highlight yeah. is that we are bringing a program called Becoming a Man. Um, we're we're going to be bringing it fully to the Healy next year to work with our middle school students, um, right. you know, especially our young men of color coming out of, out of the Mystic yep. Housing Project. And obviously, while we had hoped to be fully in the high school, New, in new high school will come this fall. That's not going to happen because, you know, church will stop for two months. Um, so this year, while we're still doing this kind of distributed high school model, Becoming a Man will be consulting with us in the high school level with the hope that we can bring them in fully next year into a new building and with the staffing model there. But Becoming a Man is clinical-based uh, mentorship slash wraparound full services model for young men of color um, who you know, our data shows in some of our high, and not just some of our high, some of our schools. Yeah. These are the students we are most failing as our young men of color. Um, and a district that wants to be about equity, wants to be anti-racist, can't have that. Yeah. I, abs I absolutely appreciate appreciate you naming that and saying so. Do you do you mind going in because we're gonna we're gonna transition into to also talking about so the budget that has now been um, appropriated specifically both on the city side and to the schools um, to fund these racial inequity and justice initiatives. Um, and I know Andre that you um, had you know, had talked um, to the Summerville Journal and, and talked about supporting the reforms. Um, but you, you mentioned something that I think is really important about this process piece. So you said, if communities of color aren't at the table, the policy results almost don't matter. I think Kurt Tony is hearing that his proposal about racial and social justice office in the city seemingly takes it to heart. But I hope to see him and activists of all stripes do better. Um, and Fran, we, yeah, any of us can speak to this question, but where are the areas do you, that you believe that we as a city and school district can and need to do better when it comes to addressing systemic racial inequities that so, persist in the education system? I think that was the big one, right? Like we have a tendency in Somerville because we're all such good progressives to just have ideas and run with them. Um, rather than 
really, to use Congresswoman Presley's term, really, you know, making sure that the people closest to the pain are closest to the power, right? Um, we've seen this in some degree, let's be honest, around the policing issue, right? Whatever my position may be on defund police, that conversation in Somerville hasn't been happening with communities like the mystics, communities like, like the communities who are on the front line for yeah. good and ill of policing in Somerville, right? Yeah. Um, so like, that's why in bringing back to the schools, we even asked, you know, to talk about the role of, uh, of policing in schools. And, you know, I think there's a couple things as a, matter, as a factual matter I, I want people to know. Um, the Somerville, what they call school resource officer, the SRO, the police officer in Somerville High, our district is required by state law to have at least one. We have one. So we have, we, we already at the minimum the state, state allows. There's definitely within that one room for conversation. Um, like one, one of the things we're starting off with low hanging fruit is it seems like we're using an outdated MOU between SPD, SPD and SPS. So we're updating it to, to modern standards. Um, but even, even there, there's lots of conversation to be had, but it's important, important to me, important I think to the district that it actually be a conversation. Um, I don't want to decide what policing in schools looks like without talking to students, which I think was hard for activists to hear this this summer because they want to do something now. It's like it's June of a year where students aren't physically in the building. Like we can't have this conversation right now with them. It's just it's not going to happen in any meaningful, real way. And they, and if and if you believe, and I certainly believe that students need to lead this conversation, it has to wait to the fall, unfortunately. So I think that the relationship between SPS and SPD will change next year. I think, you know, we're going to, we're going to look at the STEPS program, we're going to look at cadet, we're going to look at the early SRO, and we'll see changes. But I really am excited about this. I'm really excited to see how students lead this process. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah, do, Fran, Fran, do you want to speak to any of this as well from the budget side about how some of this funding will be used and where the accountability is for that, that spending? I mean, who's in charge of it? Sure, well, and, and I think that, that Andre has done an excellent job of pointing out some of these areas, but obviously we added a director of equity, Jessica Boston Davis, last year. Um, that work began this year. Uh, New York Leadership Academy came in and was doing, um, you know, different workshops with admin, principals, department heads, and that work will be continuing. Uh, for school year 2021, which we hope to be in session and not be remote, as we know, we'll see how that goes. Um, so that work is continuing, and I think there are, there are additional equity adds within the budget. I mean, we obviously understand that it's an important issue. Um, it was something that the superintendent put a priority on, and obviously we were working within pretty much a, a kind of a low bandwidth which where we could add items into the budget. And I think, um, for anyone reviewing our budget, like we were talking about becoming a man, build these equity champion stipends that um, the equity stipends that uh, Andre referenced. These are the type of items that were added to, added into the budget, where you know a lot of things were either kept, um, you know, neutral, or there were even some reductions in some areas to help fund them. Right. I think I think in some degree, and, and uh, let me start off by actually giving. This is what I was hinting at in the journal article. I want to give the mayor actually some credit because I certainly criticize him when it, when, it, when it is appropriate. So I want to give him some credit that the this proposed Office of Racial and Social Justice, one, I think you're seeing a lot of cities and towns and corporations who are now creating equity directors, diversity directors, the you know all these kind of positions. The difference that they want to give the mayor credit for is he's actually putting money behind it, right? Like. That there's he's putting a million dollars on on that, on, that, on that position in his proposed budget. That is actually something that is praiseworthy and frankly better than I was was expecting. So I'm credit for that. But it's still let's be honest. I think it's still the case where the city is playing catch up to the schools, right? Um, it has been our you know all of the school committee's current goals are racial equity focused, yeah. um, and they're racially focused on the systemic structural level. Right, we want to diversify our workforce. We want to change the way we do budgeting in our in our city, so that we're actually putting in our school systems actually putting more resources towards students who are at more risk. Yeah, um, which is both common sense and completely radical. There's no district our size that is doing this. 
Uh, I think, Fran, when you looked it up, the, the smallest district that is doing this kind of work is 27,000 students. Yeah, yeah. 25,000, 30,000. Yeah. We're 5,000. Um, wow. We want to we want to finally revisit, which I think we all anyone who's been back in school knows is outdated. Our our enrollment school choice systems. Um, so we're looking at real like it's we're we're trying to tackle big heavy systemic things that we know are barriers. Um, and so I'm I'm glad the city the city is also looking at this. I think and I and I also want to give them credit that I think the idea is intentionally informed, right? Like. Questions like how that might even decided that haven't been decided because I think the, I, this is why I said the mayor seems to be hearing it. There is a real desire to have people of color part make the, being part of those decisions being made, which if that if that ends up being the way this this rolls out over the next year, would be for Somerville a real sea change. Um, the way Somerville has historically handled these kinds of issues of outreach is that you know middle class white people build a thing, and then they ask. People call it a really nice to be part of this thing that was built without yeah. them. Uh, so, so if the Office of Racial and Social Justice isn't, doesn't end up going that way, that would actually mark a real meaningful sea change that in some ways might be more important than the real money being put behind it. And Heather, if I might just add to Andre's point about the weighted student funding that we were looking at yeah. and the enrollment planning, those are a couple of items that got disrupted with the corona, with the COVID-19 crisis, which are items that we hope to get back in full looking at them for, for school year 2021. Yeah, yeah let's, let's talk about the intersection between the, corona, the coronavirus crisis, COVID crisis, as you mentioned, and racial, and, and, and we can bring in class equity as well. Um, I know I've been teaching online programming since March. Teachers have been, you know, had, had to very quickly adapt to all sorts of new expectations, um, all, and so did parents, and so did young people. Um, I know that in the city of Boston, they estimated 20% of young people had become digital dropouts, had not had any interaction um, online with teachers um, since, or with teachers at all after uh, March 11th, as you mentioned. So I'm wondering, um, do we know anything about the impact that it's that that's had on our young people in Somerville? Do we know anything about that data or at least or even just anecdotally what we're seeing in terms of how um, COVID has exacerbated um, potentially these these um, systemic issues, as you mentioned? So I want to start off by giving our staff, our administrators, our teachers immense credit for what absolutely. has absolutely been the hardest spring of any of their careers. Um, yeah. You know, remote teaching is a completely different skill set than, as you know, than in-person teaching. Um, so everyone who is, be, be, be they partners like yourself, be it our, te our teachers, be it our parents, everyone who made that shift on a dime deserves immense credit. Yeah. Um, and I want to give our, you know, all the people who don't get, who work behind the scenes in SPS credit for the work they've done. Um, we spent over half a million dollars on providing people with, with providing students with Chromebooks, providing every kids with Kindle Fires, helping set up hotspots and helping people connect to Wi-Fi, um, which is one of the real benefits of, it, of our teaching of our size, that we were able to actually meet individual family needs. Yeah. It wasn't perfect. We missed some people. Yeah. But I think the outreach was real and you know, the investment was significant. All that being said, anyone who says that remote learning this, this spring worked is lying, right? Like we, we were at best doing harm reduction. Yeah. Um, and like everything else in American society, COVID exposed all of our gaps and all of our weaknesses, right? So we know that privilege played an impact on how much COVID affected you as a family, as a student, um, and I think, again, I want to give credit, I think I, I just did a good job of trying to combat that, and our community partners are good at combat it, but it's real, right? Like, we know that, that our students who have less other resources suffered more in the spring than, say, you know, my daughter did. Um, yeah. And I think... A lot of this fall is going to be figuring out exactly what that looks like and how we 
move forward, right? Um, one of the things that we intentionally did in this budget process is punt a little. Um, yeah. We know that we don't know things. We don't yet know what's, who's going to look like in the fall. We don't yet, and, and because we don't know that, we don't know, we don't know who's coming back. I think right. it's an underwritten story, right? Like, whatever we do, I think there'll be some families who are like, you know what, I'm not, super, I'm not ready to see my kid back to, back to school in person yet. I think there'll be staff that say, you know what, I'm not ready to go back in person yet. And in a situation where there's so much we don't know, yeah. knowing that we probably will need to make some staffing changes or some investments that we didn't already plan for, we know that, we don't know what they are yet. Right. So the school committee passed a resolution, just putting the, the, the city, the, the, the um, city council, the mayor, and the community, community at large, on notice that when the superintendent comes, when we come back in the fall and we actually know what school's looking like, the superintendent will probably say, hey, we need X resources. We don't know what those resources yeah. are, but we expect the city, you know, we've, we've been very fortunate in Somerville for 20 plus years now to have a city government that says, what do you need? Um, this is in contrast, even before COVID, to, you know, cities like Malden where they fired all their library aides, um, you know, Boston, where, where the teachers you had to go on strike to get part timers in every school. Just not, you know, these are the kind of things that we take for granted in some of the bill. Yeah. And we expect that when, and part of that obviously is that, to go back to my, my first point, SPS has done a good job of being good stewards of their resources. So we expect that when we say, hey, we need more resources, the city will listen. Yeah. That's very important. Um, I wonder, is there any, um, is there any thing in the budget specifically going towards supporting summer learning um, or summer programming? Because uh, that's one thing that I'm also, obviously I run summer programming right. and uh, actually we are uh, working on developing an online um, programming platform that will be free to kids in Somerville through a, a very generous grant from the Somerville Education Foundation. Um, However, I know a lot of other providers, out of school time providers are really like scrambling and don't know what they can do, what space they have access to. Um, you know, some programs are opening in person, other programs are trying to go online, other programs are just trying to survive. And I do wonder about, um, you know, we do know that there's like a summer activities gap, like a summer experiences gap in Somerville. And I think typically in a typical summer, you have like 50% of kids that don't have anything to do. This summer is probably going to be closer to like 75 or 80. Um, so I'm wondering if there are any um, provisions or uh, strategies or things that are in the budget or, or ideas that you have around that. <laughs> Obviously, I'm self-interested. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. I, 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 can, I can talk to the, um, the summer school aspect. Of course, with the buildings um, still being closed, it's going to be a remote we're not gonna be running the full summer school program that we would be under normal circumstances, but we do have several of our programs, programs running. Um, typically, um, our summer school programs are funded out of grants, Title I, IDEA, which is a special education grant for our SPED program. Probably about 80, 85% of our summer school funding is coming up by grant funding. So from the standpoint of the general fund budget, we wouldn't expect there to be a significant amount of dollars on there, maybe some salaries. And then that would be about the same as it is this year, obviously a less, not as a, um, as I mentioned before, a full program, but we certainly will be running some summer school programming that will be remote. And, you know, I want to speak to the issue of buildings because we've heard a lot, you know, one of, one of the resources SPS provides to community partners who obviously value immensely is space. And mm -hmm. I wish we could tell people what that plan is going to be for that space, but we don't even know what it is yet. So, right. Right. And that's, I mean, I think that's like why we ultimately had to pull the plug because it was like we don't have enough space on in, in our building. Um, and we don't know how to accommodate like outdoor space if we don't know if there'll be access to bathrooms. And yeah, yeah. it's really, it's especially we do tech camps, you know, we, we teach filmmaking, which can be done outside in you know socially distanced but animation that's harder you know um so so yeah i i appreciate that acknowledgement and i do you know i obviously i think that that will um carry over into the fall like there will yeah, be that. we don't know yet 
Yeah. And I think yeah. it's really hard for a lot of people to really hear because we, you know, we, we get this a lot as far as the plan for next year is we don't know. And I, and I think, you know, some villains and their infinite energy and power and, 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 and go get them are used to having control of things. They used to, they want to have answers. They want to know things. They want to plan. And we have to say that also we can't give you that. That's, that's, that's scary for people, but it's reality, right? Like we're going to be, give, we're going to be, we're going to be responding to the, to the pandemic, not the other way around. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, we're almost out of time, and I just wanted to give each of you a chance if you had any closing remarks or anything that you wanted to make sure that you highlighted um, before we're out of time. I'll just start. I want to give uh, props to Andre, um, who's the finance chair on the school committee. So, uh, you know, I think he's done an amazing job. As he pointed out, it's been a challenging budget year. We went from from a regular budget, as, as I mentioned in my open, to a uh, very disruptive process. But, um, you know, thank you, Andre, for uh, help guiding the process and getting us across the finish line to, so that, to the point where we have an approved FY21 budget. I was actually going to go to the opposite. I want to make sure that we thank all of the people who won't, won't be on Zoom calls, won't be in meetings, um, certainly aren't getting quoted by the journal, but all the people who've done all this amazing work to keep SPS afloat in this incredibly difficult time. Yeah. Um, Thank you both so much. This has been such a illuminating conversation. I'm so grateful to have both of you really out there advocating for young people um, in the city and making sure that we put our money where our mouth is in terms of um, equity and access to learning. So thank you both so much for being on the show and uh, thank you for watching. Thank you, Heather.